folks, because you know who I am, I'm not the project for the Corps of Engineers, and coming here now, I guess I, now that Jeff's out of the running, he broke his streak. Oh. I think my streak has got to be longer than Jeff's, which is great. Um, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys today. One thing that kind of comes through loud and clear in that previous discussion was litigation. And I just want to point out, in the last three months, for me, personally, it's never, ever, in, in 25 years of being a fish biologist, been like it's been for me in the last three months. Uh, I think some of you guys are tracking that we were sued back in 2019, originally. The outcome of that process was a finding that we had violated the Endangered Species Act. And ultimately, the judge put together a, a final order, and we've been operating under an injunction since 2021. Good parts of that, bad parts of that. But one of the things that's been implemented this year for the first time under that injunction, and will go forward, is some of these large reservoir drawdowns. And if you've read the newspaper, you've probably seen my name. And we have been taking some pretty serious heat over the drawdowns, and there's been a significant sort of public backlash uh, associated with those reservoir drawdowns. The, the reality of that situation is if you're going to pass juvenile fish from these reservoirs, those particular drawdowns at that site, at those sites, and this is specifically a lookout and a green feeder, legitimately that's your only tool. They just aren't other options, right? I mean, the options that you have are build a structure, which costs hundreds of millions of dollars may or may not work, um, huge timelines associated with that. And that's going to happen in some cases, um, probably in the North Sanium Basin, for instance. Um, but, but it's the tool that we have. What's hard about it is that tool is hugely impactful to the public and some of the historic operations. So. There was definitely a transition this year. Um, my hope is that will get better over time. But they're, they're likely to be in place and for a long period of time. And so it, it'll be interesting to see you know, what, what comes of some of that. Um, I'm hearing about litigation from, from other angles. That wouldn't surprise me. You know, it's, it's pretty typical for us that we get sued from one side and then typically then later from the other. Um, and I expect that will happen here. Um, just in the last week, DEQ is going to fine us, or sounds like they want to fine us, um, for those drawdown operations, which were done, just so you're clear, were done under a judge's final order, which is non-discretionary. Not discretionary. In other words, we didn't have a choice. And, and so, I just point that out as some context. Um, it's, we're just operating in a completely different world than when I started my career 25 years ago. I'm not saying it's good, I'm not saying it's bad, but, but it's definitely different. And, um, it takes, I think, some of the flexibility that managers had, resource managers had, and it doesn't matter who it is, it's us, ODFW, whoever it is, and, and it just ties your hands. Because, you know, I was talking to Gary about some of the flows earlier. Well, I mean, we're not in it. What we're managing to are those drawdowns that are in that corridor. We're not thinking about Gary's trail. We don't, we don't know if Gary can access a particular area in his boat. 
because we're so focused on all these these things that we need to do to meet legal requirements and it's, it's just really really um, you know different than it's been so I don't want to overly focus on that but I but I do want you to have that context um, you know some of the things that, that we're going to be doing these next couple years you know are, are trying to address some of the things that we've been sued over in the past um, obviously something like cougar downstream passage was in the our original biop in 2008 it had a 2014 timeline associated with it did we do it no did we have what we thought were good reasons for not doing it? yeah does it matter no because we got sued and we lost and and so you know that one's still out there so we've got two things that I think I'd, I'd focus on. One, I'll just kind of walk you through some of the injunction operations we're doing in this basin, and then some of the other ones you might be interested in. And then two, I'll talk a little bit about the EIS, because I know there's some questions around the EIS, and, and I know some people in this room submitted some comments um, on, on the EIS. So those are related. They're not the same process but they're kind of parallel processes that are out there. So under the injunction, one of the things that we are required to do was reconsult under the Endangered Species Act. So that, that we are doing that now, and that process is gonna finish on December 31st, 2024. So this coming December, which is gonna get here in a hurry. And the outcome of that process will be just like the previous consultation, which is at the end of the day, there'll be a set of actions that the federal government's required to take to meet its requirements under the Endangered Species Act. It's not a public process. It's a process that we work through with the National Marine Fisheries Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and ultimately, um, we end up with these actions. There'll be a timeline, you know, all these things um, that, that occur. And a lot of those things will be similar to things that we've had in the previous biops, you know, flow management, fish passage related actions, there'll be some hatchery things, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, we chose to do an environmental impact statement because it just made sense. The one we had on the books was way old. We've got listed fish, we've got all these things that are happening. It made sense to kind of embark on that, that same process now. They're not connected necessarily, but they're, they dramatically influence each other. And, and really the focus of the EIS is to talk to the public about how they'd like to see the Willamette Project managed. And one thing that I see, and I've been talking to the public more in the last year, whether it's through the media or otherwise, um, than I ever have. There's a pretty big disconnect between what we're trying to accomplish under the, the Endangered Species Act and, and I think what the public, the broad public, would like to see in terms of how we operate our dams. I hear that a lot. I hear, well, I hear it every time I go out. And, and so it's pretty tough because ideally, I think when you're your public servant, what you're doing and how you're managing something for the public would be in line with what they'd like to see, right? I mean, shouldn't that be how it works? And, and it doesn't feel that way. And it's not that way in, in a lot of ways. And so it'll be interesting to try to marry those things up in these two processes. Um, the, it's really, the, the EIS is operating under the same timeline as the consultation, so we intend to finish it up around the end of December. It doesn't have the same court-ordered timeline, so it, it could slip here or there. Um, but it's, it's a really important process, and we certainly wanted to hear from the public and we value um, what the public would like us to do with these dams. And so we've been working through that. Again, there's comments. Um, I know one of the questions in the room was, when are you gonna 
<laughs> address our comments. And I believe that's going to be towards the end of February. Toward the end of February. Yeah, so, so we'll be getting, there's been a group of folks that have been putting together responses to the comments for months and months and months and months. Um, all that will go out together and, and everybody will get to see all, all the comments and all the responses. So, Greg, are you consulting on the preferred alternative? We are. That doesn't, well, there's two things to say about that. We have to put something out there for NIMS to yeah. react to, right? So, so we put together a biological assessment, just like you do in any consultation process. And then NIMS goes through and we work together to come up. NIMS doesn't have to go with, with what we suggest, and, and they didn't previously, um, so I suspect, I think we've been working closely with them for a long time. I don't think there's tons of surprises out there, but at the end of the day, you know, they, they do have a lot of discretion to make calls, and, and so we'll be working with, and we are working with them really closely right now. It, you know, who's, that, who's that acronym? Uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service, sorry. They, they are the entity, the federal entity, that's in charge of overseeing the Endangered Species Act for anadromous species. So in this case, in our case, Upper Willamette River Spring Chinook and Upper Willamette River Steelhead. That, that drives the bus in that process. Uh, we also have bull trout listed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. You know, it, it doesn't drive the process nearly to the same extent that those two species do, in part because they found jeopardy um, on the continued existence of those fish in our in our original biological opinion, and they will likely find jeopardy. I, I don't know how they wouldn't um, find jeopardy again, um, which kind of takes that to another level in that process. Was there a question? Stephen, I was talking about that earlier. Just that exact topic. Okay. So yeah, twenty December thirty first, twenty twenty four, key date. Um, we'll have this set of actions, timelines. There's there's budgets associated with all that. I mean, it's it's it will really shape um, you know what the next thirty years looks like with the dams, how they're operated, and, and with the endangered species, and, and what improvements we can, we can make. And um, I suspect that there'll be people that are happy about that outcome and what some of those things are, and I suspect there'll be a lot of people that are not. Um, Craig, I, I did have a question. If you consult on the preferred alternative before you publish the a final, doesn't that lock you into a decision that you haven't made yet? It's, I, I don't understand all the legal nuances around that, Steve. Um, I know we had, obviously the preferred alternative is publicly available. Obviously Noah's aware of what that preferred alternative is. I don't know. Honestly, I really don't know how it would play out if it, you know, in either that. in either process, right? Whether if NIMS makes a decision no. that strays from what we think they're going to do, and conversely, we were to make a decision to go a different path based on public comment. I, I said that because we were critical of the preferred alternative. Sure, absolutely, and so so why don't you tell me? Which elements of the preferred alternative that you? I have a guess of what you don't like, but but why don't you articulate that for folks if you could? Well, we we were uh, deeply concerned about an alternative that would uh, basically move toward run of the river uh, at uh, in about eight years. Uh, the Corps of Engineers uh, stated. A minimum uh, 
level was safe level was 1440 feet and they said that after the uh, difficult uh, conditions in 2002 to 2004 so uh, the uh, we, we were uh, deeply concerned that that the preferred alternative could take us to a, a level of sediment flow that uh, not only was unacceptable f from a biological standpoint, but violated the core zone position of 1,440 feet. Uh, was also inconsistent with the EQ standards for sediment flow. So, if you pers pursued that and consulted on that preferred, it seems to me that you'd be consulting on a non-tenable uh, approach. So, yeah, this this brings up. You know, something I definitely wanted to talk about today, and I, I think that's sort of why I laid the foundation that I did out front, which is that you know we're we're implementing these drawdowns. Um, the public's got to see those drawdowns now in, in a very visible way. I mean, we've been doing drawdowns at other locations, Fall Creek, but it was very different, very short term, a lot less visible, a lot less impactful. We're certainly hearing a lot from folks, and I, I don't ultimately know how that's going to shape things. And I've gotten out of the business of trying to predict litigation, all these, you know, all these. I mean, we, there could be so many twists and turns in, in this process. If you were to ask me where we're going to land there, truly, I, I, Steve, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I know there's real strong feelings um you know on both sides of that you know just to lay out a few pros and cons i mean and this this is just true generically with structures versus say operations which is a drawdown as an operational alternative but you know structures are great because the structure runs 365 days a year 24 hours a day um, it largely allows you to operate project the way you have historically um, and so whatever authorized purpose you have you kind of keep all that in place that's a real benefit um, to most folks the con with that is these things generally speaking are hugely costly have really long implementation timelines associated with them and you if, it, if, if you had those two negatives, wouldn't you want biological certainty on the outcome? And if you don't have to look very far in the Pacific Northwest to find out that's not the case, that there's been wild variability in how these things have performed. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of a set of pros and cons around that approach. The, the operational alternatives are, you know, on the pro side, you can implement them quickly. And that's why they're being done under the injunction, right? Because that's the requirement. Um, they use, they generally use the existing infrastructure, so they generally are cheaper. And and so those are those are some real benefits. The, the con is they can have massive impact on your other authorized purposes, depending on how they're structured, or your historic operations, which we've seen with with some of the drawdowns. The other con is they're generally pretty seasonal. Like if you're using the existing infrastructure, you only have a spillway gate available for a window, not the whole year. Or you only have, you know, you can only stay in a drawn down condition for this amount of time and not the whole. So, so that it tends to be, but there tends to be, in some cases, a little more biological certainty around the outcome. And I think when you look specifically at downstream passage at Cougar, exactly what I just laid out for you kind of plays out. You know, if you go this structural route, got this set of pros and cons. You go to the uh, operational alternative, which the drawdown mostly is, you got this set of pros and cons associated with it. And so that's, you know, that's, that's the debate that, that we have um, regionally. And I, don't, I don't consider it just a Corps of Engineers issue. It's, it's really up to should be up to the people to, to figure out how to, to navigate this. And so we're working that direction. Obviously, we put preferred alternative out there for folks to react to and, and get some sense. I, I will tell you, within the internal 
group of folks, it was really back and forth around that particular issue. So it, it wasn't like 99% of the folks within the Corps of Engineers said, oh yeah, was, this is how you proceed at Coover. No, there was, there was a lot of spirited discussion. And there's a really deliberate process that would have to play out there with a number of triggers that could move it in a completely different direction, dam safety and otherwise. So yeah, it's, it's really uncertain what's gonna happen at this point. Clarification and a question. So, are the drawdowns? Do they? Ha is there anything like mandated about the levels of? The, so there's, there's the, so the the level of the reservoir comes into play. It's not just a percentage of smolts getting out or a number of smolts coming out. So there's about okay. So there's that piece of it, and then the the what kind of what's the number of like like how many smolts are we do we want to be coming out? through that drawdown, because you, you mentioned Fall Creek, and I have a buddy that works there, and they had about 20 adult salmon, give or take a few, that that whole thing was set up for that came there and that he then trucked up above. So so 20 adult salmon is not very many adult salmon, but just the statement there, I guess. And then the, how many smolt are we hoping to have come out successfully from Cougar? Yeah. So. There's, there's a lot to all that. Um, I guess I guess what I would I would say about that is <clears throat> the drawdowns were were designed um, for the judge. The judge put out this mandate: you're going to do fish passage at Green Peter Dam and Lookout Point Dam. But the judge doesn't. I mean, the judge's not going to. He wouldn't know. So he put together a group of folks to design some of these different actions that he couldn't know the details around, which was an expert panel, in quotes. The expert panel, originally the plaintiffs asked for the expert panel to have no Corps of Engineers employees on it whatsoever. I can't tell you what a disaster that would have been. It was bad enough. But it was, the judge didn't agree with that. And so ultimately, there was a six person expert panel, two employees that were hired by the plaintiffs as experts. One of them was a former ODFW employee, one of them was a former National Marine Fisheries Service employee. Two folks from the National Marine Fisheries Service and two folks from the Corps of Engineers. I was one of those folks. And that group worked on the details of, of these drawdowns, what they were gonna look like. I would tell you that's actually, it was a pretty straightforward process from, from my perspective, and, and here's why. We know what the current situation, take, take Green Peter Dam. Once we lose the spillway in the summer, there's only two places water can go out of that dam the turbine unit or the regulating outlet? How good do you think the passage is in the turbine unit? Mm -hmm. I can tell you, it sucks. It's terrible. And so what that left was the regulating outlet. So then the question is, how do you get fish to the regulating outlet? Well, by, by dumb luck and just, un, you know, just unfortunate situation, that regulating outlet is super deep at Green Peter. So to get fish within the 25 feet or so that they need to be vertically to actually find that thing in meaningful numbers, you have to draw a green peter down 142 feet from its normal winter set point. I mean, it was simple to design, but it was real, you know, we knew it was going to be hugely impactful. So there isn't a goal in terms of the numbers of smolts to get out what we're trying to track is what percentage of the fish that are available to get out are getting out and how well they survive it. Those are really the two things we're kind of track. And what can be really frustrating, and I, we'll see, it, you know, I suspect it's playing out this time, is that I suspect this will test pretty well, like the survival is probably going to be pretty good and the number of fish that get out that we put in to test is probably going to be pretty good. 
But ultimately, to get success, we need the natural produced fish. And if we don't have a lot of those fish available because they're predated long before that, that you know, just they didn't perform well in the, in the spawning, we, we get fish that in 2021, and you mentioned Fall Creek, we had a year class failure in Fall Creek in 2021. There weren't any fish to pass in the injunction in 2022, literally no fish. So these, these kinds of things can really impact, you know, how your operation actually performs. So we'll be looking at all the aspects of that, like how did the test fish perform, how did the naturally produced fish perform, and then ultimately make decisions. I think what I'm focused on is we know some of the things were hugely impactful this year. Um, you've heard about the turbidity in the dirty water. To my mind, that, that okay, that was the one that the public seized on, obviously, because it was the most visual, the most obvious. What they didn't track at all and didn't even understand was the huge impact we had on temperatures in the South Sanium this year. Huge impact. And, and that drawdown was what drove that. So anyway, we're going to focus on trying to make these drawdowns better. But the reality is we're not in a position to just make those changes unilaterally. We're going to have to work back through a formal court ordered process, which means working with the plaintiffs, working with the litigant, um, ultimately get an agreement and getting the judge to sign off on it, and then maybe make a modification, maybe not. It kind of depends on, on how that all plays out. So I don't know if I answered your question. I mean, at each location, we have historic numbers of adults that we know that used on average, some of these areas above, you know, Fall Creek is a small, Fall Creek on average, typically about 4% of the Willamette, upper Willamette Spring Chinook production. So it was always a small one. But we had, back in 2020, had 800 unmarked adults come back to Fall Creek. That was amazing. I mean, that was really, really good. And, and we know that that drawdown, there's 99% survival when we do it right on the small. So it can work. It takes some tweaking, it takes some time, and, and you know, and it's gonna take some sacrifice from a good chunk of the public who now can't access the reservoir for four months. Is gonna have dirty water. Is gonna, you know, all these things. And, and so we'll see, you know, we'll see what, what folks really want to do or are or, or willing to do um, to try to make these things happen. Jeff. Yeah, great. It, it doesn't really sound like anybody really learned from the effects of the drawdown here in 2002. I mean, that was a huge major deal here. We couldn't fish the McKinsey River for 33 straight days due to turbidity and, and then whether or not uh, there was ever DDT found in the soil. There was a huge kill off of insect life in the McKinsey that year that took years to, and it's finally gotten better but it doesn't sound to me like the panel has if they went back to the judge and said well this is our this is our best alternative it didn't sound like they listened to anything that happened here whatsoever well again jeff i, I think there are trade-offs that are being made. And, and folks will agree or disagree about whether those were the right trade-offs. And, and that's you know what's hard about the world we're living in and the environment that we operate in today is when you're operating in that environment where the litigation is sort of driving what you do, it's, you know, who's, who's the judge? I guess we need to take him out on the river and take him to the boat. Well, I, so, so we have a requirement to put together two, two reports a year that go to the judge. And both those reports, the reporting this year will, will lay out some of the water quality impacts. We're also going to, we've already signaled to the judge that we'd like to 
let to let him know that we're likely going to come forward with some changes and we'll see you know we'll see where that whole process goes okay. has there been a study to show how these fish survive going through the dam like for example at green years there was that giant kill off goby did anybody do that giant pile of goby and see how many sand and seal schools were in that pile of dead fish yeah, so that's exactly the kind of thing we're going to be laying out in this in this report, which will go to the court at the end of February. So <clears throat> that'll be based on several different pieces of data. One piece of data will be the rotary screw traps that were sitting down below Green Peter catching everything that came through. Those are good for some things. They're not the best for looking at mortality and survival, quite frankly. Um, although they get at that a little bit. But we also had tens of thousands of tagged fish that, that went into the reservoir in several different stages at several different times in that drawdown process. And we're gonna be relying on that data to tell us what was the fish passage efficiency, what was the fish passage survival, kind of those two key things. Was there an estimated number of high fish from that kill off? The pictures I saw, there was thousands and nobody went down and looked to see what kind of fish other goking was in that pile. And he, he, he no, that traps that he lost walked the group and pick up corpses. Yeah, no, that, that that group of fish, that initial group of fish was sampled by ODFW pathology. Um, every fish that they looked at was a kokanee. Um, there were not any shank in there. Um, all those fish suffered, which is not surprising, barotrauma. <laughs> And I, the other thing I, I pointed to make here is barotrauma at Kokanee was going on at Green Peter since 1969 when it went in. It's happened every year. Okay. Now, <clears throat> did a lot more of it happen this year? Yes, for what sure. What is barotrauma exactly? So the barotrauma is a situation, think of a diver that gets the bends. When, it, when those fish are down, in, in this case, why was it just kokanee? When that fish kill happened, the reservoir is relatively high at that point over the actual regulating outlet gate. And so what happens in that particular case is the kokanee are down deep. Their swim bladders are set up to deal with that, right? They're, they're, they're regulating their... <coughs> When they pass underneath the gate structure, it's like being at atmosphere, like that. I didn't do a very good job of describing this in the newspaper article, and people, you know, people are like, "Well, what do you mean they came to the surface?" Well, they didn't come to the surface. They went under the gate, and for all intents and purposes, once they pass under the gate, they're at atmospheric, you know, they're at surface. And so it'd be like them coming from the bottom, like in a microsecond, and the swim bladders can't function that quickly and so what you saw is a bunch of floating fish right in various states of, and that's the reason is because the swim bladders and then they can't even they can't even fight that and then they're on the surface it's just I mean you guys and you guys fish in the ocean I fish in the ocean a lot you know you bring a fish up from depth that happens over minutes right and they still are having a hard time regulating um, imagine a gate structure where they go under in just a fraction of a second and so that's really what went on there um, you know we're, we're talking to the state um, at the end of the day it's up to, to ODFW to kind of make decisions around what to do there um, the numbers of fish that went out are going to be in those reports anybody can figure out doing some relatively simple math, what those numbers are. I will tell you they're huge. They're really large. Um, I suspect there's very few kokanee to fish for at Green Peter anymore, um, based on that. And so the public, you know, that's the public's that, not happy about that. Would that be the same true as the, with Gip? With the big drawdowns, those kokanee couldn't get deep enough? A, a, a little bit different. I mean, what, what we saw in this case is that first event that got 
the visuals, right, where there was a real barrel trauma. Now, as the reservoir came down, and the, the head over the gate drops, the survival on kokanee went up. We were still getting lots of kokanee going out, but they were surviving at a much higher rate, and we weren't seeing the barrel trauma, which is was not surprising. And this is kind of exactly the way the the we can get slowly, slowly. that was designed. I don't I don't know all the details on the Wikiup drawdown. Um, it might have been more of a water quality issue in Wikiup versus a passage event. No snow melt. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the barrel trauma. If you, so as a diver, if you, you take a, if you were to dive down in the ocean or wherever and take a balloon and you took a balloon, it's a, it's every seven feet and something. The pressure doubles as you go down yeah. in depth. Yeah. So you take a balloon and you go down seven feet. That first seven feet, it literally cuts in half. The next seven feet, it cuts in half again. By the time you get down a handful of seven feet, you're not changing very much, <laughs> but you're yeah. still doubling in pressure. And so what happened is the reverse of that, you took that balloon that on the surface was, you know, say a foot in the kokanee swim bladder, and then you just immediately let that expand to full surface temperature. It went from a tablespoon to a, you know, a 10 inch balloon in that period of time. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. 50 years ago, Andy Stahl said at the University of Oregon Law School, we're going to use the spotted owl to stop logging in the state of Oregon. And he was right. He was successful. Finally, the timber industry and the forest products industry started <clears throat> reacting to that type of litigation and put their lawyers and their advocates into the courtroom. Are you seeing any uh, courtroom participation by the multiple use advocates such as this group and other groups now contesting the Native Fish Society and Oregon Wild as they try to stop the use of our resources? It's a good question. And I'm assuming you saw the proposal to kill 500,000 barred owls as a way of Improving spotted owl just came out recently. No, and this is, I mean, I'm not trying to be critical of the Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act, well intentioned, it's been in place for 50 years. It needs, from my perspective, it needs some tweaks. You know, there's, there's some things that, that could be tweaked to make it better. Um, but, so remember this. If somebody was going to address the litigation that's in place for us under this existing order, you'd really be doing that through the lens of the Endangered Species Act. So when I think about, well, how would somebody do that, I, I don't come up with a lot of great ideas about how somebody could say, gee, Corps of Engineers is, in taking this approach, is is violating the Endangered Species Act, and they should they should stop. Um, will other entities find other reasons under the Clean Water Act, under you know other environmental laws, and bring litigation? I think so. We're we're hearing rumblings that several of the municipalities are going to sue. I don't know under what grounds. It won't be under the Endangered Species Act findings. I can't imagine that. Maybe it will be. Um, I suspect it'll be under some other water quality related, you know. Um, I, I don't know. You know, this, it's in a, these entities, um, I think, play an important role. I'm not here to diminish what they do. They. They, they play an important role in the process and, and having a debate around some of these issues that I think are important. Um, I do think at times maybe the outcomes that they get are, are maybe overweight for what, and this is what I was getting at earlier about being sort of out of balance with where the broader public is. That, that part to me doesn't feel quite right um, in, in, in this particular case, but you know, it's just part of the process. Yeah, great. 
So back to uh, Chris's question and Jeff uh, point. Uh, it raises a question of, of monitoring. Uh, the question, of course, referred to what, what's the goal for, for uh, escape juvenile response. What would be the uh, strategy to monitor at Willamette Falls, for example, for fish out of Cougar? Uh, would one uh, attach uh, pit tags for those uh, juveniles at Cougar and then monitor them at uh, Willamette Falls? And if that would be an approach, uh, is, is there any uh, interest in doing that? Yeah, so with the monitoring, I think, you know, from my perspective, you want to take a multi-pronged approach. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there to monitor fish these days, right? And each of them have strengths and weaknesses. And so I think where you get your best read overall is to take this multi-pronged approach. So in this case, you mentioned pit tags. Um, pit ta we pit tagged a bunch of fish that are going into the reservoirs. Um, we've tagged fish with a variety of other types of tags. The pit tags are good because they're cheap. You can put, put them in a lot of fish. But where they fall down a little bit is if you don't have infrastructure in key locations in the rest of the basin to really track them, then you don't get much feedback, or you don't get much data back on those pit tags. And, and that's unfortunately in the case in the Willamette is, is kind of the case. Um, the falls has had, had an array. It always had really low um, efficiencies associated with it, which made things hard to interpret. So in this particular case, Steve, we've got some other types of tags that are going out. We have infrastructure in place to track some of those things further down basin that I think are gonna give us a better, some better feedback uh, on that kind of stuff and, and give us a, a bit of a clearer answer. Pit tags will always be part of, part of Willamette Basin um, fish monitoring. Um, but we've gotta make some real investment in the infrastructure to really improve that tool in our toolbox. I ought to go backtrack a little bit. Use the word jeopardy a while back. I interpret that word the way you used it. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> we are protecting the bull trout, which are impacting the protected spring chinook. Is that what you were referring to as far as jeopardy? No. Jeopardy has a very specific meaning under the Endangered Species Act. And, and so when the National Marine Fisheries Service or the Fish and Wildlife Service um, find jeopardy, it means that you've jeopardized the continued existence of the species based on the action that you're taking. Okay. And that just puts you in a kind of a different category in, in terms of some of the requirements. So you cannot ultimately, as a federal entity, we can't preclude the recovery of these species or jeopardize the continued existence of the species. Bull trout in our basin are, we, they did not find jeopardy. Why? Well, because the listing unit for bull trout is what? The lower 48 states. It's not the Willamette Basin. It's not, it's a much broader area. So um, in, our, in our case, the Fish and Wildlife Service, had they kept some of the designations that they had historically for bull trout, they would have found jeopardy, but they did not. Um, so that that's why they kind of play second fiddle to the Chinook and, and Steelhead. Thank you. Greg, yeah, when we talked at some point this fall, um, you talked about the timing of the spring drawdown actually being in the winter, like January, February, I think is what it said, or through the proposal according to the DEIS. Which, which site, sorry? Oh, at Cougar. Cougar, okay. yeah. And then, um, which concerns us more than the other. <laughs> Yeah. And and then what, what would the timing of the fall drawdown be under the DDIS? Yeah, the preferred alternatives. So yeah, and I, I did hit that because we ended up talking about a bunch of other stuff. So we are doing a couple of things under the injunction at Cougar. One is a drawdown. 
it's it's not the drawdown that we're doing at the lookout point in Green Peter. It's it's a drawdown right now to the lowest elevation that we can operate to in the cul-de-sac using the existing water temperature control tower, which is only 27 feet below the minimum conservation point. That is happening um, in mid-November through mid-December, and then we're bringing the pool back up to minimum conservation pool. The other action we're taking, which is a big departure from the normal operations and does affect this group, is what's called a delayed refill. So instead of beginning to fill Cougar on February 1st, the way we have historically, the pool is flatlining. It's staying at minimum conservation pool. And then it's gonna actually drop a little bit, just a little, like 10 feet. Um, and then ultimately we'll fill a little bit in the late, late spring. The idea there is that you have a smaller pool, less depth to intake to the existing outlets, and the fish can, juvenile fish can find their way out, and especially these smaller life histories um, fish, the, the fish that are just coming into the reservoirs. That's, that's the biological goal. We'll see how that in practice works. Under the the EIS, I think there's, or, or the preferred alternative, there's, there's probably two components to that. There's the actual design.